So the news came out last week that Hajime Tabata, someone who I'm sure you're all very familiar with at this point due to his role as the director of Final Fantasy XV, has formed his own studio within Square Enix called Luminous Productions. And before I go full on into this huge video where I'll be doing a big history lesson, offering insights as to how this situation has occurred and what exactly it means, I'd like to say that this is actually a pretty big deal. Of course for Hajime Tabata personally, but also for Square Enix as a company and for us as fans and gamers. To give some rather extensive context as to why I feel that's the case, we're going to take our customary dive back into the archives. And the first place we're going to head is back to 2013 when Yosuke Matsuda replaced Yoichi Wada as the CEO of Square Enix. Since then, there have been some fundamental changes compared to what was commonplace under the stewardship of WADA, and two of the biggest changes have actually been around the promotion of innovation and diversity of product. We've spoken before in previous videos about how one of the key propositions that Yuichi WADA led with following the merger between Square and Enix was to really amplify the notion of polymorphic content, where properties that they felt had legs would be exploited through the use of expanded universes. Wada later noted that when using this approach, their intention with a franchise like Final Fantasy was to literally get all the juice possible out of it, by selling consumers the same concept several times over. This could see the creation of sequels, spin-offs, mobile titles, books, movies, and figurines. And if you look at Final Fantasy XV, with its grossly bloated out and excessive universe, it's safe to say that Matsuda has wholeheartedly embraced this approach too. But the difference between the two of them is that Wada used this approach to a fault. There was no plan B. In the earlier years of Square Enix, Wada did use polymorphic content with great effect to steady the ship and place the company on some firmer financial ground following the tumultuous years that had come before. Final Fantasy X-2 acted as something of a litmus test for this under Wada's stewardship prior to the merger with Enix. But the compilation of Final Fantasy VII, which was conceived by Yoshinori Kataze and Tetsuya Nomura, would represent a full-on test case for this approach, and it succeeded. It meant that they were able to generate significant returns for the company, but as the years rolled on and we saw more expansions, sequels, spin-offs and mobile titles, we saw less and less innovation and diversity coming from Square Enix. You have to think that back in the days of Square, the company was constantly expanding and taking risks. Final Fantasy was actually one of those risks, a last ditch attempt by Hironobu Sakaguchi to create something that would become a big seller for the company. But it also saw the creation of tons of other unique properties like Chrono Trigger, Super Mario RPG, Ergies, Bushido Blade, Brave Fence and Musashi, The Bouncer, Bahamut Lagoon, Front Mission, Tobol No. 1, Einhander, Xenogears, Parasite Eve, Radical Dreamers and Vagrant Story. And honestly, I could just carry on listing games because there are so, so many. I mean, they were even making games related to pro wrestling, baseball and simulation racing. Yep, they created Driving Emotion Type S, a simulation racing game with the hope of rivaling Ridge Racer 5 and Gran Turismo 3. Spoiler, it didn't. My point though is that while Square did make RPGs, and they made them really well, they were constantly exploring new opportunities and while they of course looked forward to the financial returns that the release of the next Final Fantasy game would bring, they had their hand in so many different pots that it was never something that they were actually too reliant on. Enix were also in a similar situation, albeit from the perspective of solely being a publisher. They worked with third party developers like Tri-Ace and Chunsoft and Dragon Quest was definitely their big title. But they were also happy to support the creation of other games like Actraiser, Illusion of Gaia, The Seventh Saga, Terranigma, Buster Groove, Mischief Makers, Valkyrie Profile and the Portopia Serial Murder Case, a murder mystery game by Yuji Horii, the creator of Dragon Quest. Years before Square Enix eventually purchased Eidos, they were even responsible for bringing Tomb Raider 3 to Japanese audiences. But since the merger, Enix also went down a similar route, with more Dragon Quest spin-offs being produced than you can probably shake a stick at. And that's not to say that since the merger fresh titles haven't been developed, they have been. The issue was that even if they were good, they just didn't sell well for whatever reason. 
and all this came to a head following the release of The World Ends With You. It was critically acclaimed, but it just didn't sell, and with Square Enix's financials not looking too pretty at that point, according to Kotaku Insiders, Wada apparently told employees that if they wanted to keep their jobs, they should stop making games that only they wanted to play. It would see a massive reduction in the development of fresh new IPs and new concepts, and an upscaling of games related to Final Fantasy and Dragon Quest. From that point on, during the rest of Wada's reign, we only had a few new properties come out of Square Enix. There was Infinite Undiscovery and The Last Remnant that were part of the financial agreement that they had with Microsoft, a couple of Japanese exclusive DS games like Blood of Bahamut and Sigma Harmonix, Mind Jack, Kane and Lynch, and Army Corps of Hell. None of them really set the world on fire, and a lot of them were actually critically panned. The only exception from this was Bravely Default, which was ironically a spiritual successor to a Final Fantasy game for Heroes of Light. When Matsuda came on board, he identified pretty quickly that things had just become stale within the company and that Square Enix had become far too insular. They had become too reliant on a few big budget games like the Tomb Raider reboot, Hitman Absolution and Sleeping Dogs, and they just didn't deliver what was needed based on the investment. He pointed instead to Bravely Default as the type of game that they should instead be championing, and over the years that followed, Matsuda would put his money where his mouth was, implementing a more diverse plan that would see the company focus on expanding the quality of its mobile offering with things like the Go franchise, Kingdom Hearts Key, and Brave Exvius. They would experiment more with niche Japanese titles, like the new Nier Automata and Saga Scarlet Grace, and they would just give existing franchises more room to breathe, instead of constantly putting them to the grind. Oh, and he also started laying down the framework for the creation of new properties. This started with the launch of the Square Enix Collective, an initiative very similar to the one that Enix was actually founded on. Developers could pitch their ideas for new IPs or the revival of old IPs within Square Enix's locker, and if they were successful, they would be put to a community vote to see which games Square Enix would then choose to support. There have so far been hundreds of games that have been part of this initiative, and it's led to the successful launches of games like Goetia, Battalion 1944, The Turing Test, and Black The Fall. We've also just seen the revival of Fear Effect, although that unfortunately reminded us that not every release through the collective is a winner. Elsewhere, things also progressed further, as during E3 2015, Matsuda took the stage and announced the opening of a new studio called the Tokyo RPG Factory, a very blatant name. They would be tasked with creating new RPGs that had a retro feel, and it would act as a real statement of intent that they were looking to try and recapture some of their earlier magic. Their first title, called I Am Setsuna, was developed by a reasonably small team and was considered a big success, having managed to sell at least 250,000 copies. Their second title, Lost Fear, has also just released, and although it hasn't sold as well, there has been no indication that there will be a change to their approach moving forward. Last year, it was also announced that Square Enix will be opening another new studio, called Studio Istolia. They revealed that the studio would be helmed by Hideo Baba, who has been working as a producer on the Tales franchise for the last decade, and that they had begun working on a brand new RPG under the codename of Project Prelude Rune. We've actually heard very little about this title since the announcement, and I'm sure that most people have actually forgotten it even exists, but I'm sure we'll hear something about it soon enough. We've also seen the successful release of Life is Strange, and instead of pushing people to churn out and create more sequels, Square Enix has instead started pushing people to create new things. Octopath Traveler, for example, is from the Bravely team, and Left Alive is another new game, albeit part of the Front Mission franchise, that is being worked on by prominent creators from the Armored Core and Metal Gear franchises. And in line with letting franchises and developers breathe, Crystal Dynamics are actually taking a break from working on Tomb Raider for the first time since 2005, as they're now working on the Avengers project. And instead, Idust Montreal have stepped away from the Deus Ex franchise to work on their first full Tomb Raider game, while also supporting on the Avengers project. And while Don't Not are working on a sequel to Life is Strange, they've been very clear about the fact that they want it to take place in a new location with a completely new cast of characters. Square Enix also chose to sell the Hitman franchise, as well as its developer IO Interactive, and Matsuda was very candid about the fact that they sold them because they just didn't feel as though they were the right publisher for that franchise anymore. It means that while change based on Matsuda's original statements and plan has been slow, change has very much been happening, 
and it's seen Square Enix go from a net loss of approximately £91 million in 2013 under WADA to a £134 million net profit last year. And in the next few years, we should really start to see the fruits of their labour as Square Enix are looking to further return to their roots and continue to grow the company in a positive manner. Which leads us nicely onto the announcement of Hajime Tabata's new studio, Luminous Productions, who are also working on a brand new IP. And honestly, it's about time, as if you take a look at Tabata's CV since he joined the company in 2003, it pretty much reads the damning indictment of Wada's approach. Tabata's first project was to direct Before Crisis Final Fantasy VII, which was a mobile spin-off within the compilation of Final Fantasy VII, which was a subset of the Final Fantasy brand. But he then moved on to directing Crisis Core, a handheld spin-off within the compilation of Final Fantasy VII. He then co-directed Kingdom Hearts Coded, a mobile spin-off within the Kingdom Hearts universe. He directed The Third Birthday, a handheld spin-off in the Parasite Eve universe. He directed Final Fantasy Type-0, which was originally a mobile spin-off within the Fabula Nova Crystallis subset of Final Fantasy called Final Fantasy Agate 13, but then eventually ended up being a handheld spin-off instead. He then produced Final Fantasy Agato, a mobile spin-off which was based on the original concept for Final Fantasy Agato 13, and finally, he directed Final Fantasy 15, which was originally a console spin-off within the Fabula Nova Crystallis subset of Final Fantasy called Final Fantasy vs 13. So yeah, he's worked in a prominent leadership role on seven games during Wada's tenure, and all of them were spin-offs, and if we count Final Fantasy 15 as kind of its own thing, Four of them weren't even first generation spin-offs, they were derivative spin-offs. Based on this, you can kind of understand why when talking about what he was going to do next after Final Fantasy XV, Tabata has therefore chosen to distance himself from working on another Final Fantasy game, whether that be Final Fantasy XVI or a continuation of the type franchise. Instead, he wants to take everything he and his team learned from working on Final Fantasy XV and apply it to a completely new experience, something which he's not yet had the opportunity to do during his 20 years within the video games industry. Choosing to take over the directorship of Final Fantasy XV from Tetsuya Nomura was a huge risk for Tabata. If the game flopped, his reputation would have been mud. But he didn't just deliver, he absolutely smashed their internal expectations, and that gave him a lot of leverage. Apparently enough leverage to not only get the green light to work on a brand new IP, but also the creation of a brand new studio. And this is why the creation of Luminous Productions is something that genuinely excites me. Tabata is an extremely ambitious individual, and through constantly stepping up to the plate for Square Enix, he's been rewarded with the opportunity to make his own legacy. They've also declared that their mission statement is to utilise innovative technology and creativity to change the future of gaming and entertainment. Based on this, I'm therefore expecting him to again rise to the challenge of braving this new path in creating new big budget AAA IPs for Square Enix that are universally accepted as being top tier. By my estimation, the last game that actually attempted to do this from Square Enix was Kane and Lynch. But from Square Enix Japan specifically, it was probably the last remnant back in 2008, a decade ago. But if you want to look at the last AAA game from Japan that actually succeeded in that regard, you'd probably have to look beyond Square Enix to Square and the creation of Kingdom Hearts or Vagrant Story. It's kind of sad when you think about it. Either way, we already knew that Tabata was actually working on a new IP, but now that it's going to be created under the banner of Luminous Productions, it just feels more separate from the rest of the company. Previously as Business Division 2, they were often pulled in to help out on other projects within Square Enix Japan, and as we detailed in our extensive look at the Type franchise, that's why Final Fantasy Agato 13 took around 6 years to make. But this kind of thing should now change. According to Alpha who actually reached out to Luminous, Tabata has now resigned from Square Enix to become the Chief Operating Officer and Studio Head of Luminous. So it should mean that they're able to work on their own projects with less distractions from other projects within the classic Square Enix business division hierarchy. Well, outside of Final Fantasy XV, which is of course going to continue to be worked on by the Luminous team as they had previously planned until 2019. At this point, my best bet for what Tabata's team are actually working on would probably be Agni's philosophy. As we've pointed out before, even though it was only a technical demo to showcase their advanced work that they were doing with Nvidia, until the announcement of the Final Fantasy VII Remake, it was the most viewed trailer on the Square Enix Japan YouTube, and even now it's still only half a million views off Topspot. 
It would therefore make complete sense for them to leverage existing interest around this product as opposed to trying to create something new from scratch. But yeah, that's my recap of the whole situation with my hopes and dreams thrown in towards the end. How do you guys feel about the fact that Tabata now has his own studio and what do you guys think they're actually working on? Let us know in the comments below and as always, if you enjoyed this video, please hit that like button and subscribe to our channel. Also, be sure to head over to our Patreon at patreon.com forward slash ffunion to find out how you can support our channel and even get your name at the end of videos like these awesome folks. Alright guys, thank you so much for watching. This is Daryl signing out. I will see you next time for more Final Fantasy videos.